we're looking at verse 7 to uh, 16. Uh, in many ways, uh, it's certainly an important passage of Scripture. Uh, it can be seen as a controversial uh, passage of Scripture for a couple of different reasons that will become uh, a little more self-evident as, as we go through. Uh, but last week, and we won't review the, uh, the entire book uh, again, most of you passed the midterm last week, so we're just moving on towards the, the final now. And uh, uh, at any rate, uh, we, so we looked at this subject of chapter 4 as uh, unity uh, in the church. And there was a call and a challenge and exhortation. Uh, and we ended last time with the prayer of Jesus in John 17 about unity. And this kind of continues, but it's unity with diversity. Diversity in terms of the spiritual gifts uh, that God gives uh, to each person in the body of Christ uh, and, uh, and there's our slide from last week. So we're kind of looking at the, all those people in that little church to remind us of the uh, unity uh, there is to be in the church. And then we've kind of added this to it. <laughs> lots, of, lots of gifts. Uh, everybody receives a, a gift. So that's our, our second little uh, image. Uh, I, I thought this was an interesting uh, description of, of a, uh, uh, the uh, NFL draft is coming up here. So the... Uh, uh, I know that's on many of your hearts and minds this morning, but uh, one definition of a football game is described as, uh, quote, uh, 11 men on a field in desperate need of rest, surrounded by 50,000 people in the stands in desperate need of exercise. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes that's a description of the church as well, uh, unfortunately, uh, because uh, not everybody is... Uh, uh, discovering, uh, understanding, and exercising their, uh, their spiritual gift. Uh, and so we're going right, to uh, jump right in here. And if you've got the outline in front of you, to try not to panic. You've, you may have already looked ahead and saw that there's seven points of this message. But uh, I'm, I'm going to quit, you know, when it's time to quit. And if we've got to come back and finish later. It's kind of like you ever make a salad and you keep finding more stuff and you keep, and pretty soon you've got to get a bigger bowl to hold, hold it. It was kind of like that. But uh, <laughs> part of the seven points was to try to bring clarity uh, as well because, uh, uh, again, it... Uh, it's a very rich passage of scripture, but uh, it's one that can be uh, greatly misunderstood uh, as well. Uh, well, let's look at the verse 7, 11, and then we'll, we'll kind of uh, pick this part. Uh, uh, but the first point is going to be there are particular gifts, and they're given by grace. Uh, Paul says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors uh, and teachers. So our... Uh, uh, first thing we, we want to mention about this idea of spiritual gifts, uh, these particular gift or gifts uh, obviously are given to, uh, to each one. Uh, grace was given, uh, and again that the word is charis or gift, was given to the measure of Christ, Christ's gifts. Uh, it just means uh, in, uh, uh, very emphatically that <laughs> every person in the body of Christ has a spiritual gift. And you say, well, I don't really feel like I've got one. Well, I'm sorry. I don't, it doesn't really matter what you feel like, what you believe, or what you think. <laughs> it's real clear that everybody has a spiritual gift. And you may not know what that is. And we'll, we'll go through a, a series of maybe things to think about, questions to ask, to help you uh, understand maybe what your gift is. Uh, but uh, the next thing we just uh, want to point out is that uh, spiritual gifts are not the same as uh, natural gifts. <clears throat> I don't know if you've seen this uh, thing or on Facebook of this, uh, I think he's six or seven years old, this little, I think he's Chinese kid that plays the piano and plays classical music and is awesome. <laughs> and he, he's just this little kid. <clears throat> his sister started taking piano lessons. His older sister, <clears throat> when he was four, he just started to <clears throat> sit down at the piano and started playing. And um, his parents thought it might be a good idea to get him lessons as well since uh, he didn't know what he was doing and he was better than his older sister. And he plays, uh, <clears throat> plays incredibly. And uh, just the, these long, long, long pieces that uh, uh, he starts playing. And there's a film of him. He starts playing. And at some point in time, he just shuts his eyes. And he's just ripping and playing. And then when they uh, interview him afterwards, uh, they ask him how he does it. And he says, well, 
I don't really know. I just play and I just feel the music and I just play. I don't really know how I do it. And uh, I think we'd uh, all agree, he's gifted. <laughs> Very gifted. Uh, and that's a, a natural gift. That's a natural talent or ability. Some people are good at math, some kids are good at music, uh, athletics. Uh, you may or may not be gifted in a, uh, in a natural gifting. Uh, that's not the same thing as a spiritual, uh, a spiritual gift. Be thankful if you have both, but whether you feel like you have any natural giftings or not, uh, everybody has a spiritual gift, but it's not the same. Uh, the next thing to note is that uh, the grace mentioned in this context is not speaking of salvation. Uh, grace here means the ability to perform the task that God has given you when it says, verse 7, but to each one of us grace was given. Now again, we're saved by grace, and Paul's already had a very thorough discussion of that <laughs> in chapter 2. But the word, again, each here is uh, emphatic uh, in the Greek. And it means each and every person receives one of these spiritual gifts. There are, uh, there are no, no exceptions. Well, I didn't receive the Lord until I was much older. Well, I, didn't, I received the Lord when I was very young. So it doesn't really matter when you prayed to receive the Lord. Uh, you received a spiritual gift or gifts, plural, uh, at that time. Uh, the other thing to note here is that Christ is given gifts or gifts uh, and he, as he has apportioned it. Or as it said, according to the measure of Christ's gift. So uh, the same gift, but uh, differing measures. Uh, some people may have the gift of teaching, uh, and some of them may be much better at it than others. Uh, some are, are much uh, better at teaching uh, 1,000 or 10,000 people, uh, and some people are not comfortable with that. Uh, they feel much more comfortable in that gift of teaching with four or five uh, some people feel much more uh, uh, at home and uh, exercising that gift of teaching with kids versus teenagers versus new believers. It's, it's the same gift uh, as Christ has apportioned it. Uh, the, uh, therefore, the idea that, uh, that um, some people are better at something than someone else is, uh, that's not a biblical concept or, or idea. Uh, Christ has given gifts to people, uh, whatever it might be. I mean, we're talking gifts of administration, gifts of mercy, gifts of helps. As we look at some of these lists, I'm just using teaching uh, as an example. Uh, but uh, according to Christ, uh, the measure uh, that Christ has given it. Uh, now, over in Romans 12, verses 3 to 8, and uh, I've got it on the screen. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, you might want to turn there, and there might be a couple things worth uh, underlining. But uh, uh, again, over in Romans 12, uh, I'm going to read verses uh, 3 to 8. Uh, uh, of course, many, many discussions about spiritual gifts in the New Testament, but I think uh, this will help uh, uh, bring a little illumination. Uh, Romans uh, 12 says, uh, 3 says, For Paul writing also, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. You know, don't, don't get prideful about uh, any of these uh, issues of, uh, of gifting and what God has given you or not given you. Uh, for as uh, we have many members in one body, uh, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ uh, and individually members of one another. So again, this... Uh, this unity, but a great diversity uh, within that unity. Now here's, uh, he breaks into the issue of gifts in verse, uh, uh, verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Some people are going to exercise that gift in a completely different way than, uh, than, uh, than others do. Uh, or ministry. Let us use uh, it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, uh, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives uh, with liberality, who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with, uh, with cheerfulness. So uh, again, everybody's given a gift. It's not the same thing as a natural gift or a natural ability that the Lord may have given you at, at birth. Uh, but everybody gets at least one, uh, and it's uh, according to the measure that Christ determines for you uh, uh, because of where he's placed you within the body, uh, the body of Christ. Again, 
uh, many gifts uh, and even how they're given to the degree they're given really vary. And the bottom line is uh, we, need, uh, we need everybody. Now, where this is all leading to in the end is uh, certainly that God would be glorified in the, in the church, in the body of Christ. Uh, that we would grow and mature. We're, uh, we're not going to have unity and immaturity at the same time. We're going to have unity as we grow and mature. And apparently that will not happen if uh, everybody's not on board with this idea that, some, that they've got a gift to use and they're using it. Uh, because we're, we're like a physical body and we're always going to be missing our left arm or our right toe or something. We're going to be a bit dif- dysfunctional uh, unless everybody's exercising their gift whatever it is, and to the measure that God has given them uh, in terms of using that particular gift. So that leads us to how do I know what my, my gift is? And of course, there's books written on this, seminars given, and so forth. But uh, just uh, five simple things to think about. Uh, one is we've already mentioned, recognize that they're, they're not the natural uh, talents uh, you may have. Uh, Mark may be a, uh, uh, gifted musically, be able to sing and play the guitar, uh, that, uh, that helps if you want to be a worship leader, but it doesn't guarantee you'll be able to be a, a, a worship leader uh, because that's a whole separate issue, for example. Second, you learn by doing. Uh, just as uh, a natural talent, uh, uh, you, uh, that little kid had to sit down to a keyboard to find out that he had a, a, just a tremendous gifting or natural ability to play the piano. Never sits down to a piano. They never have a piano in the home. Maybe he never find, finds it out. Uh, it's, uh, again, it's unless you jump in, uh, you may have a gift of teaching, but if you've never tried to teach, you would have no idea. Sometimes it's by doing. Uh, you maybe have some inclination to what your, your gifting is. Maybe you're a super organized type person. Uh, and you can help, maybe you're gifting, or there is a, a gift of administration. There's the gifts of help. There's gifts of mercy. Uh, I'll give you the references in a minute to all of the lists. But you have a tendency to learn by doing. You also learn by observation. By being involved, you observe others using their gifts. And you might find yourself drawn then into some kind of ministry where you, you use your own gift. Uh, and, and in other words, it becomes a, a very obvious as you go through this. Uh, it is virtually impossible for a person on their own, isolated, by themselves, away from a local church in the body of Christ, to ever really discover and use and develop their spiritual gift. This is all in concert with, with each other. Uh, sometimes you <coughs> learn by observation. You're not likely to s- discover a spiritual gift uh, being the Lone Ranger Christian. For you, you may learn from the observation uh, of others. And sometimes it's very helpful. You may not really quite understand. You think you may have an inkling as to what your spiritual gift is. Uh, But sometimes it's a good thing to ask somebody that knows you well. Sometimes it's easier to see it in in another person. And uh, uh, I've just seen that often. I see people that are like, it's it's pretty obvious to me what they're gifted in and stuff. And I'll say something. And they're like, really? You think so? You know, it's like, yeah. I think it's pretty obvious, you know. But it's interesting. The uh, don't come ask me, but you know, ask somebody who's a, ask your husband or wife, ask somebody who's close to you, uh, and uh, or you could ask me. I may or may not know, but it's somebody that's able to observe you. Sometimes that's uh, very helpful. And then uh, five, learn in prayer. Uh, again, the First uh, uh, Corinthians um, uh, fourteen one, uh, f- uh, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. So part of that eagerly desiring, as we're commanded to do in Scripture there, uh, is the idea of, hey, spend some time uh, in, in prayer uh, and uh, in seeking the Lord. Now, I think I've gotten your notes. Uh, the list that we have are 1 Corinthians, a uh, couple of passages, Romans, uh, 1 Peter. Uh, and one thing is for sure, uh, the lists are not the same. Uh, when you look at them, uh, that would lead me to believe that they're not comprehensive. In other words, uh, there's probably other gifts uh, that are not contained uh, here on these particular lists. Uh, but uh, but uh, <laughs> we need to say this in regards to that. The gifts are always for building up and, and never tearing down. So if you're wondering, there is no gift of criticism. <laughs> that, that, you, you might be good at it, but that's not a spiritual gift. 
There is no gift of discouragement. You know, you, you, you may have, people have observed that and pointed that out to you. You're very discouraging to be around. That is not a spiritual gift. These gifts are always for the building up uh, and never tearing down. And they're given by the grace of God. And they are particular gifts. That's point number one. Secondly, uh, there's a, a prophecy fulfilled by a conquering king. Here we kind of wade into a little bit, a bit of deep waters here, verse 8. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Paul is saying that Jesus, uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his death and his resurrection, uh, and in the way he's established the church of Jesus Christ, uh, he's actually fulfilled prophecy. And here he quotes uh, and borrows some language uh, from Psalm 68. Uh, in that psalm, in verse 7, God is pictured as marching in triumph uh, over uh, before Israel after the Exodus. In verses 11 to 14, the kings and armies are described as fleeing from this uh, conquering king in God's people. And then finally in verses 16 and 17, from Mount Sinai, God sets his sights on Mount Zion or Jerusalem and moves with uh, tens of thousands of thousands of chariots upon the slopes of Jerusalem in victory. So that's the sum. What, uh, what uh, Paul does is he grabs a, a portion of that passage about the conquering king and he applies it to, uh, to Jesus Christ. But what he does is he flips one of the words. In the psalm, because the king has conquered, men are giving gifts to the king. But Paul flips that and says, we have a conquering king who's giving gifts to us. Uh, and that's how he changes that psalm. But Paul here alludes to the fact that Certainly Jesus has, uh, uh, has conquered, and he is our conquering king, and he has fulfilled uh, prophecy uh, in that sense. The other thing that needs to be pointed out when it says, and gave gifts to men, uh, this is not our word we've been looking at so far, charis, uh, or where we get that idea of grace or, or spiritual gifts. It's another word. It's the uh, very simple Greek word, doma. That also means uh, a present but uh, uh, here it's different. It's talking about a spiritual gift. He would have used the same word. He's saying that Jesus is our conquering king, and he's given gifts to men. And he's going to talk about those gifts. He's not left the church without leadership. He's gave, given gifted men to the church to lead the church. And he talks about four offices in terms of apostle, prophets, evangelists, and, and, and the pastor uh, teacher. Uh, so that. Uh, is the, the prophecy fulfilled by a conquering king. Uh, there's a place entered into where captives are set free. Uh, and again, if you've read through this on your own and kind of scratched your head, uh, maybe this will help. Uh, I'll give you a couple of different uh, views here. Of course, the second one, mine, will be the correct view. I just <laughs> point that out ahead of time. But again, verse 8, just to read this again in context. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So that fulfillment of that prophecy there. Now this he ascended. What does it mean? That he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Wow, where's that? He descended is also the one who ascended. Of course, this is all Jesus far above the heavens that he might fill all things. Uh, two, two views, uh, uh, as I mentioned, one is uh, they would say that, well, uh, you've got Jesus, the conquering king. Uh, there's a descending uh, and ascending, uh, and in his incarnation, when he left heaven, was born in a manger and took on human flesh, he descended. The only problem with that is that into the lower parts. That, that, that makes that a little strange, but that, that is a view commonly held. And then when he ascended, is talking about when he when he, uh, his death, his resurrection, he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Uh, and there's a lot of, a lot of good uh, Bible teachers, commentaries that are respected, that hold that few. It's a very simple <coughs> explanation. <coughs> what I think is here, though, is Paul is telling us what happened to Christ uh, between the time that he died on the cross uh, in his appearance on Sunday morning. There's a little gap in time there, uh, what was going on. And to really understand this, we have to kind of understand uh, what Jesus spoke about in Luke 16 in terms of uh, what happened to people before he came and died for their sins. Uh, what happened to unbelievers and what happened to believers. 
Uh, and what was he talking about when he told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise? Uh, what was that speaking of? And I've got a, we won't read through the parable, but uh, basically what you've got in that parable is uh, Jesus describes uh, uh, in, in this story a man named Lazarus who was a beggar and so forth, and he dies. Uh, and then there's a rich man that knows him, and he dies also. Uh, Lazarus the beggar ends up in paradise or Abraham's bosom. Uh, the uh, rich man uh, ends up uh, in a place of torment, referred to as Hades or the Hebrew as Sheol. And, uh, and there's a fixed gulf in between. Uh, it's interesting uh, because uh, they, can, uh, uh, they can speak to each other. And the uh, rich man is saying, uh, please send Abraham, please send Lazarus back to warn. I have other brothers to warn them, you know, so that they would turn and place their faith and their trust in God and not end up where, where I am. Uh, and in the parable, of course, or the story, uh, you've got Jesus' comments that even if one rises from the dead, they won't believe in, in reference to his own uh, his own death uh, and resurrection. So uh, Old Testament believers, if they died in unbelief, they went to Hades, a place of torment, uh, a temporary place of torment, because this is not, they haven't faced the great white throne judgment, uh, and they haven't been cast into the eternal lake of fire yet. It's a temporary place. Uh, you had Old Testament believers that died and they went to Abraham's bosom, or like the thief on the cross, to paradise, same name used for the same place. Why? Why couldn't they go to heaven? Because they had to wait for Jesus, the Messiah, to come in and die for their sins. Uh, they died in faith, looking forward to the Messiah coming uh, and dying and shedding his blood for their sins. Once Jesus did that, uh, then they could uh, go to heaven. And this is what this passage is talking about. When it says, now this, he ascended, but what does it mean that he also first descended into the lower parts before Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father? During this time between his death on the cross, his appearance on Sunday morning, he goes to this place, and Peter mentions it and puts it in this context in 1 Peter 3.18. He says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, being made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. That's what we're talking about here. Who were they? Who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved uh, through water. Uh, Jesus went and preached, uh, and of course, to those that were there in disobedience in Sheho or Hades, uh, they're hearing the message uh, uh, that brings condemnation to them because they did not place their faith in God. They did not believe the Messiah would ever come uh, and so forth. Uh, and of course, then he is able then to take with him those that died in faith and like the thief on the cross uh, and take them uh, to heaven with them. So then, in case we've already maybe gone by that second slide, but uh, so the, uh, again, so you have what's left is uh, now when believers die, we go directly to be with the Lord, to be absent from the body, to be present with Christ. We, we, that whole thing of Abraham's bosom has now been taken to heaven or, or emptied out. Is Hades or Sheol still there? Yes, it's still there. People that die rejecting Jesus Christ still go there. It is a place of torment, but it is a temporary place of torment. And one day, all of them will stand before Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment. Uh, and again, this is not to determine whether they're guilty. They're guilty. Uh, it's, uh, everybody is born into sin. That's why they sin. All of sin to come short of the glory of God. Uh, standing before the white throne judgment will be a sentencing. Like right now when somebody is convicted of a crime, they're convicted. They're guilty or they're innocent. And then they come back later to find out the sentence, what will happen to them. That's what's taking place at the great white throne judgment. The main point here is Jesus is the conquering king. He is the one who ascended far above the heavens. He is the one who gives gifts to individuals. And he gives gifted men to the church. Uh, the gifts then are from the conquering king, and they're given for a purpose. Uh, God uh, 
didn't die on the cross, rose again from the dead, and give spiritual gifts to every person that comes to faith in him uh, so that they could choose to, if they really felt like it or not, <laughs> exercise their spiritual gift. They're, they're given for uh, a reason uh, and for a purpose, uh, and without them, uh, that person will not mature uh, in Jesus Christ. Without them, the church won't grow into maturity uh, and the unity that can be uh, in our midst uh, if we're all functioning and all on the same team uh, together. We're just talking to, uh, it's, it is also baseball season, so the <coughs> Pete's coaching um, uh, T-ball again, uh, what I call Three Stooges Baseball. It's, uh, they're, they're fun to watch, and uh, Pastor Kevin's uh, son Luke, is out there with Elijah and everything. We're talking about uh, uh, baseball a bit, and I was uh, reminded of this book I read a number of years ago that I read to uh, my son Josh when he was probably 12 or so by Jerry Jenkins. Jerry Jenkins is uh, the guy that co-wrote all those books with Tim LaHaye, the whole Left Behind series, and a uh, very, very gifted writer, and uh, they were into reading those books, and I, I found out that he had written uh, a book about a, a young guy. Uh, a little kid who uh, basically is uh, being raised by his mom. He's been separated from the dad. Uh, and um, uh, the dad at uh, one time was a professional uh, baseball player. Uh, never, never made it great, but uh, made it enough to at least play minor league ball and stuff. And, uh, and that was his uh, claim to fame. And, and uh, his son uh, loved everything about baseball because it, it, it was this closest thing he had to uh, actually being with his dad and so forth. Uh, and so he... Uh, he could tell you every box score, and he kept up with everything. Uh, and his dad, uh, again, uh, he had his own issues and problems, and, uh, and because of that, they had been separated for a long period of time. Uh, and his dad was getting ready to go to, to prison uh, to serve uh, some kind of sentence. I don't recall what it was for. Uh, but he wanted to give his son a gift uh, before he uh, went to prison. And so what he gave him was a, was a pitching machine. And... Uh, I'm a coach, so that means a lot to me. I know that means a little to you, but uh, uh, it's a big deal if you've got a pitching machine. <laughs> and uh, so he sends uh, this pitching machine. Of course, the kid does, uh, he has to figure out what it is. Uh, then he has to put the thing together. He has to figure out how to use it. And, uh, and the, the rest of the story is about the, a lot about this kid and the pitching machine. Well, he figures it out. And this kid becomes a phenomenal uh, hitter because that's all he does all day long in the basement of this apartment building in Chicago is... Uh, is hit balls. In fact, he can't afford baseballs, so he buys golf balls. <laughs> They're a little smaller, <laughs> and he can't afford a real baseball bat. He buys what's called a fungo bat for fielding infield. It's real thin, so he's like, he's hitting baseballs with a broomstick basically, from the time he's eight or nine years old, hundreds a day, and uh, we'd say he could see the ball well, <laughs> and uh, and the rest of the uh, the stories about his. Uh, uh, breaking in the scenes in the major leagues and so forth. Uh, the point of the, of the story is the gift was given with the anticipation of it being used. And in the process of it being used, his son's future would be changed forever. Uh, God gives us gifts to be used for a purpose. And he anticipates then we being changed forever through the use of those spiritual gifts. And we in turn impact the lives of others because we're using the spiritual gift or gifts uh, that the Lord is, uh, is giving us. Uh, and just one other note before we move on. You recall one of our previous passages in chapter uh, 3, verse 20, and, and maybe remember the, uh, the little picture that went along with it. Paul says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly ab above all that we ask or think, according to the power that we muster up ourselves. <laughs> no, it's according to the power that works within us. Uh, it's his power. It's the power of his spirit. It's the gift he's given us. It's not a natural ability. It's a gift that he's given each of us. Uh, again, uh, costly. Uh, it took a king that died to give us these gifts. So there's particular gifts. Uh, we've said uh, Jesus uh, fulfills uh, that prophecy of the conquering king. Uh, and then he's the one that then places then uh, into the church gifted men uh, to, to lead the church. Uh, and that's where we're at in verse 11. The gifts are people given for leadership. And he, gave, and he himself gave some to be apostles, uh, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers. So uh, Paul here focuses on four, uh, four gifted positions of, of leaders. The first one is the apostle. And uh, because of our study in 
in Acts, uh, uh, pretty familiar with this uh, term and idea, just one that's been sent forth. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about it, used 81 times in the New Testament. Uh, we've already mentioned the 12. Sometimes we call them tongue-in-cheek, the A apostles versus the B apostles. But uh, uh, Paul's already made reference to uh, the holy apostles and how God used them to, to write the New Testament. Uh, are there other apostles? There, there are many. Uh, Barnabas uh, and James are both mentioned as apostles. Timothy, Titus, and Epaphroditus, uh, Epaphroditus is used uh, as, uh, as apostles and mentioned. Uh, and there's two more that are mentioned in, uh, in Paul uh, greeting the church in Rome at the end of that letter in chapter 16, verse 7. I uh, greet um, Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen, my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. So uh, in a very narrow sense, sure, there were 12, uh, but in a much broader sense, the apostle uh, is a term of someone who is sent out and typically sent out uh, uh, to preach the gospel, to reach uh, in areas where the gospel has never gone before. So it's typically cross-cultural. So our, our current day missionary would be pretty close to this idea in this, uh, in this terminology. I... Uh, I, I wouldn't suggest putting that on your business card, though, if you were a little, a little concerned about that title or whatever because of the, the Big 12. Uh, but uh, uh, God has given uh, gifted uh, individuals. Obviously, uh, in this case, uh, these apostles, because of the type of leadership role that they had, uh, all that are mentioned are men. That doesn't mean that doesn't, God doesn't call women as missionaries as well. Uh, then there's the prophets, those who speak uh, on behalf of God. Um, and we've met a few of those. Uh, again, somebody said, well, uh, there were prophets in the Old Testament. I don't really think there's prophets in the New Testament. Well, we met a guy named Agabus in the book of Acts. Uh, and you remember when uh, Paul goes back and stop at uh, Philip's house, uh, he's identified of having daughters who were prophets. So, uh, again, that could be uh, men or women. Uh, this is a spiritual gift. It is not the same thing as the office, the office of a prophet in the Old Testament. Uh, men like uh, Elijah and Elisha and others who spoke to a nation on behalf of God. The office of a prophet, it's a spiritual gift of a prophecy. And, and uh, uh, we, uh, we just say it's very simple. It's just being the mailman. Uh, God, God speaks to you and then you just deliver the message. Uh, that's all it is. And um, try not to edit. Just what he tells you, you just deliver the message. Uh, and that, that gifting could, uh, according to the measure that Christ has given. Uh, so maybe that uh, is primarily uh, uh, exercised uh, when you're having coffee or tea with a brother or sister. Hey, I really sense the Lord saying that, you know, uh, maybe you should think about this. You know, uh, versus somebody that, that stands up in a big meeting and, Thus saith the Lord! Yeah, if you want to, you know, have to... Speak King James, of course, but uh, <laughs> the problem with, with that kind of exercising, and it's, it's fine to some degree, but uh, we have to, you know, Paul says, in, you know, ju there's instructions for all these gifts, and we're supposed to judge whether the, uh, that, that message, that prophecy is from God or not. Uh, and it's, um, so sometimes people will try to do it uh, in a way that is very intimidating so that you won't question whether it's really from God or not. But uh, despite the uh, tone of the voice and King James or no King James, uh, we're supposed to listen and then determine whether that really is a prophecy from God. Uh, and uh, Paul says this about the, that particular gift. Uh, I've already mentioned 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, verse 1 says, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. That's why we see that's primary, primarily used in your own personal devotions because you're speaking to God. He says, for no one understands him. Uh, however, in the spirit, uh, he may speak mysteries. Uh, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort. Let me say that again. If somebody has the gift of prophecy, it will always be edification to build up, to build up a person. It will be exhortation. It will always be to build up, or it will always be an exhortation. Again, uh, could be a correction, or could just be an encouragement. That word means both, and it will, or it will bring comfort. Uh, if it doesn't fit to one of those three words in that definition, it's not a prophecy, it's not a spiritual gift, and it's not from the Lord. 
uh, you may get up and give your opinions about things and say, thus saith the Lord. Uh, but uh, uh, Paul gives some very defining. Uh, is an important gift. He says, man, uh, everyone should desire spiritual gifts, and especially this particular gift. And God can use it in a, uh, in a powerful way. And sometimes, you know, we might have times of just praying with other people and God speaks to us uh, and speaks to an issue, uh, to a person and so forth. Uh, but sometimes it's just simply done at a plot lock when friends are together. Uh, we, we don't, uh, I wrote a little series one time and, and uh, about uh, the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit and gifts and I titled it Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. You know, the King James is Holy Ghost and we try to take the ghost out <laughs> to try to demystify something that's supposed to be just a normal, natural, just kind of a normal part of our uh, experience here as, uh, as believers. Uh, again, he who uh, prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, comfort, and men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself but he who prophesies uh, edifies uh, the, the church. So, uh, again, uh, sometimes uh, we ask, do, well, do we have any uh, modern-day prophets? I, I don't think that we really do in terms of uh, the Old Testament office of a prophet. I'll give you an example. The closest we've got are probably a, a guy like Billy Graham. I mean, again, somebody that when he speaks, pretty much the whole body of Christ is listening. And, and again, even that, that's not even true today. Uh, but, uh, but there's a... There, I would say the majority, or at least most uh, evangelical Christians, certainly, Billy Graham's got something to say uh, and something of uh, concern on his heart and so forth. Uh, he is so re respected that pretty much everybody is listening. That, that maybe gives us our best glimpse to this idea of the office of a prophet uh, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, but uh, I don't think we have that office of a prophet, but uh, I think many people have the gift of, of prophecy. I think many of you probably have the gift of prophecy and you've never exercised it. Many of you probably exercised it and you didn't really re realize what it was uh, or acknowledge that, uh, uh, that it was. But, but I tell you, if, you, if God speaks to you and you deliver the message, and then that turns out to really, the response is, you have no idea how I needed to hear that today. I'd say that was the Lord. <laughs> you know? <laughs> What are you talking about? Well, maybe it wasn't the Lord. You know, it's like you can kind of tell, you know. And uh, but even sometimes uh, uh, the reply back or the, you know, can that person can come around later and say, actually, I did need to hear that. But uh, uh, it, it's such an important gift. Uh, everybody's got a gift. And, may, and maybe yours is, is prophecy. Uh, and I would say that uh, uh, just in sheer numbers, there's, there's got to be because of how important this gift is. Paul kind of elevates it here. Uh, it's, uh, it's very important in terms of uh, uh, the functioning uh, of the body of Christ. And then there's the uh, evangelist. Well, this is interesting. This word is actually only used three times uh, in the New Testament. Uh, everybody is uh, called to evangelize in the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Paul tells Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, even though Timothy was, uh, was a pastor. Uh, Philip is the guy that is referred to as an evangelist, uh, because he's up there in Samaria, Samaria preaching the gospel. He goes down to uh, uh, minister and share the gospel with the Ethiopian uh, eunuch. Uh, but again, we're all called to evangelize. We're all called to share the gospel. <clears throat> but it's, if you've been around somebody that has this particular gift, it's, it's pretty obvious. And again, to the, to the measure, you know, there are the, uh, there are the Billy Grahams and the Greg Lorries and the Louis Palau's and others that have that are gifted evangelists who speak to to thousands. Uh, and there's uh, there's others that that uh, pretty much wherever you go uh, with them, they're going to be sharing the gospel. And uh, uh, Strat, my brother-in-law, certainly comes to mind. If you've uh, been around Strat at all, uh, he's never never leaves home. Uh, is you know how you you may not leave home without your credit card. He never leaves home without a track. Uh, and um, I don't care if we're camping in the middle of nowhere on the big island. He's got one on him. If he's got to seal it in plastic before we go because we're in the water, he'll do it. But uh, uh, some people, they, they're just really gifted at it. They love it. They, they thrive on it. Uh, and that's the idea of the, of the gift. We're all, we're all called to it, uh, but we're gifted in different areas. Uh, Danny Lehman is, uh, is, uh, is another guy, maybe not preaching to the thousands, but his whole life has been dedicated to training missionaries and being involved in missions, and part of that is uh, uh, evangelism. Uh, Danny and I were attending a, a Christian 
conference uh, down in Waikiki, I think it was at the Sheraton or somewhere a number of years ago. We left <coughs> to, go, uh, to go eat lunch and we found a plate lunch or a bento or whatever and, uh, and some, some planter box that we could sit on to, uh, to eat and everything. And it was interesting as we were sitting there and just the, the, uh, you know, the, the numbers of people that are you know, on the streets there in Waikiki. And uh, uh, Danny, was, uh, he was, as he was eating, he was getting all excited. He says, wow, you see all these people? Uh, uh, man, if, if you know, if we if we could get a little stage over here, if they if they let us get you know a permit, we can set up a little PA system. You know, we could be preaching the gospel. And, you know, thousands of people right here would be here. That if you ever thought about going into Makiki, I mean, there are thousands of. I walked through that neighborhood and prayed. Uh, there are thousands of people packed in those apartments and need to hear the gospel. The you know, and you know, and I have to tell you, I wasn't really thinking about that. <laughs> and. Uh, I, I actually was, I was very concerned that when we went back inside with those guys that are the teachers uh, at this, quote, Christian growth conference, would they be really teaching the word of God or not? Uh, would they really be equipping the people uh, for the works of service that God has called them to or not? And I was, I was kind of concerned about that. And it was just interesting. It was just kind of rolling in the back of my mind. And then, and then Danny, it's like, we, we just, we, we wear two different caps. Uh, I'm the pastor teacher type, and he's the vet. Now, I love to preach the gospel, share and so forth. Uh, but this is somebody that, that's, that's their main passion, their drive, and they're, uh, and, they're, and they're good at it, gift of evangelist. And then pastor teacher, and again, uh, these two words uh, go together. And... Uh, uh, just not to bore you with too many details, but um, uh, the Greek structure indicate that pastor, teacher are one gift. They're, they're not, uh, not divided. Uh, we don't see it in English. It's there in the Greek. Uh, in verse 11, it says, and he himself gave, gave some to be, uh, and there's actually uh, the pronoun, the, the apostles, and some the prophets, and some the evangelists, and some the pastors and teachers. Uh, you don't have a pronoun in front of teachers. And because uh, you've got two nouns, you've got a pronoun before them, they're, they're connected by uh, the conjunction and. Uh, it means those things are synonymous and, and go absolutely together. So we might say pastor slash teacher. So what's, what's your point? What's that mean? Uh, that means if you're uh, called to be a pastor, uh, you're a teacher. Uh, and if you're not a teacher, you're not called to be a pastor. See, that, that's, that, that would just be... Uh, Big news in, uh, in some, some churches uh, right, uh, right there. Uh, it's supposed to be a gifted person who is the pastor teacher uh, exercising their gift of teaching. Uh, and again, it's, it's so that the church will be built up. Uh, and we'll look at more of that moment. But uh, uh, the word is used also translated elder, bishop, uh, many times. Uh, Peter uses the term shepherd for this position in 1 Peter uh, 5.2. Again, a bit of a description here uh, for the uh, pastor-teacher uh, gift. Uh, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseer, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, uh, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory uh, that does not uh, fade away. That's why I'm not really worried about my hair loss, because in heaven I'm going to receive a crown of glory. <laughs> Maybe it'll be a head of hair. <laughs> Don't know what that's like exactly. But uh, uh, here's the idea. Uh, Christ is our conquering king. <clears throat> Paul says he doesn't leave the church. At his ascension, he doesn't leave the church without leadership uh, that he played before. Now he's given for positions or gifted men, in some cases women, uh, and uh, at least one of those giftings and positions uh, in terms of uh, leadership for, for the church. Uh, the fifth thing here is that there's a distinct purpose for the gifts, very important. Uh, for the equipping, verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God uh, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the purpose includes preparing God's people for, uh, for works of service, and that really is why we do what we do uh, on a Sunday morning and on Wednesday night. It's an attempt uh, to equip you so that you can go out and do the work uh, that God has called you to do. 
Again, uh, how do we do that? That concept is certainly supported uh, in Paul's letter to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16. Uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, we'd say the woman of God also, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for uh, many good things. No, it actually says every good work. Uh, what else do you need besides the Bible? Well, actually just the Bible. Uh, when it comes to spiritual things and doing something on, on God's, uh, God's behalf. Uh, the term service also uh, means ministry. We have the same uh, term used in 1 Peter 4.10 uh, where Peter writes, uh, As each one has received a gift, uh, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Notice, if anyone speaks, and there are a lot of gifts that have to do with speaking, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers or serves, it's actually physically doing something, and there's a lot of those gifts, let him do it with the ability which God supplies. Then in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Uh, amen. And uh, uh, so, and, and what's being taught here, again, doesn't always, um, it's not always reflective of what we see in the church. I, I read one article that said there's really three kinds of churches. Uh, one is the pyramid church. So that's the, the pastor at the top of the pinnacle and everybody else is, is below him. Uh, then there's the bus church. Uh, this sees the pastor as the bus driver and everybody else is sitting behind him and some of them are even dozing off asleep. Uh, that's another model. Uh, this idea is every Christian is a minister. Uh, the church uh, is a place where people come in to get instructed and to be, to be taught. <laughs> Sometimes you think, oh, it sounds like this is like a Bible college in here. Pretty close. Uh, uh, that's the idea. We're coming to get, you're not coming to get, so you feel better. Uh, and you'll feel more blessed to get instructions uh, because the Bible has got everything we need. It thoroughly trains us for every, every good work. Uh, and every person becomes a minister. Every person has a, a gift or a, a position that they can do. And it doesn't matter who they are, uh, and it doesn't matter uh, their, uh, their intellect, their education, their socioeconomic background. Uh, it just doesn't matter. Uh, God's got something for, for all of us to do. And I was reminded of hearing uh, David Hawking a number of years ago uh, uh, talking about a guy that would come in his church and at the time, this church kind of had the more of the traditional pews. Uh, and if you've ever sat uh, in those before, uh, on the backs, there's a, a little wooden rack where the hymnals go. And there's, there's little pencils in there, uh, I think, for filling out your little tie thing before you, you put it in or whatever. And uh, I, I only knew they were there for doodling, you know, when I was a kid. But uh, uh, he had a guy in his church that uh, was... Uh, uh, was a you know a, a little bit uh, had a little uh, was really challenged uh, you know mentally and so forth. But he had a ministry in the church uh, and it was a pretty good sized church. And he would he would come in every Saturday and sharpen every pencil, and he would just go pew by pew by pew. This this whole thing that would probably seat uh, you know eight eight nine hundred people and sharpen all take him a couple three hours. That that was his ministry. But he had a ministry. Uh, he knew what it was, and he was faithful in doing it. That guy will get the same reward as, uh, as a Greg Laurie or anybody else because he's been given a different gift and a different measure of it, and he'll be judged on whether he's been faithful in it or not. This is God's economy. We, just, we look at things very, very differently uh, in, in this world, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but everybody's got a ministry. It's all valid. It's all got to be there. Uh, or we'll never uh, reach maturity. Notice it says, until we all become uh, mature. And that's certainly the, the goal for, uh, for every, every believer, to become uh, mature. Uh, like the little boy, he ran to his mommy and said that uh, he just measured himself, and uh, uh, he's uh, eight feet tall. And uh, she said, uh, well, how did you measure uh, yourself? And he, he took out a ruler that uh, went up to six inches. Uh, sometimes that's the way we measure ourselves. Uh, we're, we, we think we're mature and we're really not. Uh, we're, we're, using, we're using a six inch ruler. Sometimes we think we're doing pretty good. Ray Stedman uh, said this, he says, we all have a mental image of ourselves uh, as at least to some degree whole and mature. We all think of ourselves as more mature than we, <coughs> we really are. 
Uh, for we have enormous capacity for self-deception. Occasionally, there are times when we are forced to be brutally honest with ourselves. We make a major mistake. We get caught in a terrible sin. We cause pain to someone uh, we truly care about, and then our self-image is shattered like a broken mirror. We despise our lives and say, I am nothing but a stupid, stubborn, immature fool. Uh, we want so desperately to be mature and Christ-like, but we so easily fall short. Uh, you're always in a better position than fooling yourselves. It's better to know who you really are than to think you're, you're something you're, you're, you're really not. Paul says this uh, in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 10, 12, and he's talking about the false apostles there. Uh, and he says, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, the false apostles, measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves among themselves, and they're, they're not wise uh, for, for doing that. Uh, the only way we'll ever grow and mature in Christ is if we figure out what our spiritual gift is and we begin to use it uh, to the measure that, that God has uh, uh, given it. And I, I would tell you also, uh, just like, uh, uh, like a, a natural gift to some degree, uh, it, it will develop over time if, if you use it. And, um, but uh, you can't learn to swim by reading a book. <laughs> and you can't follow Christ by even reading the Bible. I suggest you read the Bible uh, every day. But if you never take those words and enact them and put them in, uh, into your life and into play and application, you'll never grow more like Christ. Uh, and as uh, Ray Stemmons said, we have a tremendous capacity for self-deception uh, until something ra radical happens uh, and like a mirror that's broken, uh, all of a sudden our lives are, are kind of shattered. Uh, and God allows that at times, that, that we'll understand how immature we are and that we need to grow. And if we don't grow in maturity, uh, we're never going to grow in terms of, of unity. Uh, six, the gifts are to protect us from, from false teachers. And I have three minutes to do two points, so here we go. Uh, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Again, if we, if we don't grow up, we remain like children. Those are uh, the words that are used there. Trickery, cunning, deceitful, plotting. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting that the, the cultists, I don't know if you ever thought about this, the, the cultists do nothing to win a lost soul. Uh, you won't see a cult group uh, in an uh, inner city. Uh, you won't see them uh, in a, uh, a downtown area feeding the homeless and so forth. They don't do that. They're not interested in winning a lost soul. They're interested in, in looking out and trying to find the immature Christian. When they knock on your door and you say, oh, I used to go to church, they go, all right, you're just the person we're looking for. The person that knows a little bit about a Christianity, the person that maybe even accepted Christ but never matured uh, in, uh, in their faith uh, because uh, you're like a child being tossed to and fro. There's, uh, <laughs> I was talking to this with my grandson the other night. Uh, there's a reason when you go to McDonald's, there's a thing called a happy meal. Uh, and that's to make it less stressful par for parents because, <laughs> because otherwise that menu is way too diverse. And by the time you hit the beginning of the drive through you actually have to, to talk to that person and the speaker. Those kids will change their mind 12 different ways. With only three Happy Meals, they can only change their mind three different ways. It kind of limits it down. That's what children do. They're constantly changing. And that's what immature believers are. Oh, it's this guy. It's that book. It's that speaker. I got to see him. Uh, it's this doctrine. It's that doctrine. It's the new thing this. Uh, and they are deceived. Uh, that's what happens to the, the immature. Uh, and then lastly, the gifts are produced through growth uh, in the body of Christ. This is where we've been kind of aiming for here in all these things, verse 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself uh, in love. So here's the, the corporate unity in the church that we're to have. A mature church uh, will have people uh, that are mature and are helping other people become uh, mature. Uh, the idea of speaking the, the truth in love is, uh, can be translated doing the, the truth in love. I like this quote. It says, it's been well said that truth without love 
is brutality, but love without truth is hypocrisy. Uh, and we, we need both. We need truth in love. And certainly Christ exemplifies that. We belong to each other. We affect each other. Uh, and we need uh, each other. Uh, through gifted leadership, who teach the word of God, we'll, we'll grow, we'll mature. Uh, it's, uh, it's in the word God's people are equipped for ministry, whatever that ministry might be. Uh, and in doing so, we mature corporately together and are able to live out the truth in love. Amen. Shout from down in the deepest dark A rising fire and light You come rushing like the wind and burn Like a flame to fill the night A voice of thunder full of wonder Of abundance, heaven's trial Glory breaking down the walls of God. Every nation, every tongue, every daughter, every son, every father, every mother, every stranger, everyone to become. Oh, yeah.